Well, hey, good morning, everyone. It's Tractor Man 44 here. Today, we're going to start the process of finishing up this whole thing. For right now, what we're going to concentrate on today is pumping in 26 quarts of 8090 into the rear end and final drive. I think it's going to take, as much as I can tell, 26 quarts to satisfy the requirements for the transmission, final drive, and then also a little bit for the uh, side uh, belt pulley here up here on the top. It does not have a, a separate sump. It has its own level, but it's a common to the final drive or the rear end, transmission rear end. I've already put about a quart in that sump up here via that one fill tube or fill hole, and I'm going ahead and pump in the rest here in the back. Now what I can do, I can put a big funnel there, stand up here and hold that five gallon bucket and pour that in, but it gets a little tiring holding five gallons, you know, for it the entire length of time. So I'm just going to pump it for a while. When it gets down around two gallons or something, maybe I'll go ahead and dump that in a funnel. Because a funnel with a larger snoot is going to be a lot faster than this old pump. This old pump, by the way, is just a, a standard pump just like this right here. It's made to fit in a five gallon bucket. And it's got a nice little bend or a hook on the end of it here. I guess I could turn the light on. It's got a neat little bend or a hook on it. And you just uh, insert that right in there and just kind of hold itself in place. And then just go about the business of pumping. I don't know how many cc's per pump, but uh, it takes a little while to pump, you know, five gallons in. So we're going to go ahead and fill this up, and we'll be back. Well, most of the bump bucket is pumped in, so we just dump the rest of it. We're about 26 quarts and a pint and a half later. There's my beginning, my dribble coming out. So that's the capacity on this particular tractor. It's setting reasonably level, almost perfectly level. So I have to assume that that's pretty close. Now doggone it guys, here I went and did it again. I got so excited getting this thing wrapped back up that I went ahead and got the temporary fuel tank on. I got it piped in here while I just rubber. I got the battery all hooked up and everything. Got the throttle quadrant hooked up. Put a new spring under the throttle quadrant and everything. I had to put replacement grade 8 bolts in. There was a couple of grade 8 replacements in there. And then there was a couple of old square heads that was in there. So I'm just changing them all to grade 8. Of course I don't have grade 8 nuts. So I just got grade 5 nuts on them. I'll go ahead and get a half inch. and go ahead and uh, a half inch drive. And I'll snug those up a little bit tighter. We're out here in the sunlight, might be able to see just a little bit better. Uh, remember all the water that got into that uh, rear end and final drive? The only culprit that I could think of are these little funnels here. I've got 11 recessed bolts that hold this transmission top on, and out of those 11, uh, there were nine of, of them that had to broke the washers were broken. I think I talked about that before in the videos, but I think what happened is over the course of the time, the Tarps given way, snow blown up underneath them, whatever, and continual rain. I think I kept these little funnels full, and it slowly, over the period of several years that I had this sitting here, they slowly went ahead and filled up that uh, that final drive and transmission. That's the only explanation that I've got. The shifter is very well protected. It does not open up or anything. It's a metal cover. It's not a rubber boot. I had to make a new fitting around the end of it to hold the pin in place but that was not the culprit at all. There was no other breachings or openings at all inside this transmission housing. So that has to be what, what, the, what, the, what the story is. And of course, from this angle, you can probably see my better, my newly and improved, newer battery box. Here's my new and improved battery box. Yeah, it might be a little cumbersome if you put accessories on it, but this tractor's not gonna do anything like that. But it's nice, big, not in the way of the gas tank. It'll hold virtually any size battery I need to put in here, and it's all made out of scrap material. The other one obviously was somewhere up under here. I made a, I made one, but it just wasn't quite right before. That's why I went ahead and just abandoned that one and went ahead and made this one here. So yeah, we're gonna go ahead and take a little run around the back end and see what uh, what it feels like. Transmission doesn't feel real good. It's, it feels a little bit jumpy and stuff in there, but uh, that's okay. We'll see how well it does.
Okay, the next step on this old guy is going to be um, finishing up the tank. Now, I performed uh, electrolysis on the tank in May of 2020. Uh, completely cleaned it out as good as what I can. That was somewhat of an issue, and we'll go over that here in a little bit whenever I go about the process of, of coating the inside of that tank. But because it has a baffle in it, uh, that created somewhat of an issue. But at any rate, the next step is going to be going ahead and preparing that tank for reassembly. i got to find the sediment bowl. I, I'd look for the sediment bowl and I couldn't find it the other day. So it's in there in, in one of the clean-out buckets, you know what I mean. Then after that, the next order of business is going to be doing something about the silly rear wheels completely out wide, all the way to the end of the axle and turn to the outside. It's just plumb silly. A lot of guys like to do that because they're afraid of the hillside, afraid of these row crop or tricycle or narrow front end tractors on the hillsides, but you got to have a feel for the machine. This will get you in more trouble with these things out wide in some cases than it will if they're in narrower. When they're out wide, they're putting a lot of extra stress and strain on your outer axle bearings. I uh, never really thought about that until I was talking about my much, my much older brother the other day, and he said that's why he keeps his in all the way all the time. I just like them in because it's neat and trim and it lets me get in tight places because that's where we're at. We're in tight places. But that's a very good point about running them out wide. One thing that I did too, or that I will tell you too, I had them out wide one time on a little Massey Harris 22 and bumped into a tree in the middle of the winter. Now it was stone cold, man. I mean, it was brutally cold. And I'm in first gear, not going crazy fast. I bumped into a tree, just didn't clear it, and it snapped that trumpet housing or that the rear axle housing that bolts onto the rear end uh, itself, just snapped that thing in two. That's another thing. With it out that wide and you run into a tree or a stob or something like that, it's got that much more leverage to do that damage to those castings. Now, I don't think you'd ever have to worry about that on this tractor here. They're much more substantial than that, than that little Massey Harris 22, but it's still something to think about. That's what I got to do. Get these cotton pickers into where it's a good usable spacing for me out here and the things that I do. You can do what you want. A lot of people prefer them out wide because they're, they're afraid of that teetering, you know what I mean? Uh, me, not so much. But at any rate, you know what? I'm going to put this puppy back in the shed and I'm going to wrap this one up. This is Tractor Man 44 and I'm out of here, guys. <laughs>